بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد اللهم ربنا لك الحمد والشكر كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار أما بعد ويقول تبارك وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم خذ العفو وأمر بالعرف وأعرض عن الجاهلين My respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Today I want to talk about a very important topic that affects all young Muslims and maybe not the so young. Young, you know, in Islamic tradition, you are young up to 40. When you have past the 40 marks, you start going into the decline. So, and this is the question of identity. The question of al hawiyyah Identity. Who am I? I have come across quite a number of young Muslims who have who are living who grow up in Australia maybe they are born in this country they grow up in this country they re, they reap the benefits of this country yet if you were to ask them are you a muslim australian or australian muslim some of them not all would deny being australian altogether and somehow they feel that it's actually embarrassing to say that I'm an Australian Muslim or Muslim Australian. They feel somehow that both cannot be combined together. You cannot be a Muslim and an Australian, or you cannot be Australian and Muslim. This is a problem that exists among young people. They have what, they, what is it's an identity crisis. Am I a Muslim? Yes. Am I an Australian Muslim? or Muslim Australian, <coughs> or what am I? You find that it's easily acceptable if you were to say I'm a Pakistani Muslim, or a Palestinian Muslim, or a Libyan Muslim, or a Bangladeshi Muslim, correct? You find that it's quite easy and totally acceptable. I am an Arab Muslim, I'm a Lebanese Muslim, I'm a Muslim of Lebanese background, or I'm a Muslim uh, who's Palestinian. We find that quite easy and it's quite acceptable because it is. But for some reason, when we begin to say I'm an Australian Muslim, we feel there is a contradiction. We don't feel there is a contradiction when we say we are a Pakistani Muslim or an Indian Muslim or an Arab Muslim. But when we say we are an Australian Muslim or Muslim Australian, some of us begin to feel, oh, maybe being Australian Muslim is not the same. And that is a serious problem among young people, and that's why there is, whether we like it or not, and I, the adults who are here, inshallah, I'll give the same talk to the wider community after, there is an identity crisis among our young people, and sometimes we, we add to that crisis. When, for example, in the house you say to them, no, you're not an Australian, you're a Muslim. As human beings, we can have multiple identities at once. For example, a man can be a father and a husband and a son and an uncle at once. Correct? Psychologically, human beings can have multiple identities without necessarily compromising one over the other. And the beauty about Islam, my respected brothers and sisters, is that it did not come to mold us or shape us on one culture or cultural identity. Listen to me very carefully. Islam did not come out of Arabia to Arabize people, did it? Did Islam intend to make all Muslims Arabs? It intended to make all people who accepted Muslims. 
but not Arabs. And the Fuqaha say, the scholars of Islam, they say, Islam did not intend to Arabize people. It meant to Islamize them. And there is a difference, meaning you can retain the good, the useful, and beneficial of any culture and at the same time be a Muslim. And that is why Islam was very successful when it was spread out outside of the Arabian Peninsula, Al Jazeera Al Arabiya, when it came out, it was very successful to spread very quickly because Islam did not want to destroy people's cultures or their local indigenous identities. But Islam intended to enhance them, to improve them, and add to it a very important layer, and that is the layer of Islam. And that is why in the history of Islam, when you speak about people, you speak about the Persian Muslims and the African Muslims and the Arab Muslims and the Chinese Muslims, correct? How long do you think Islam has survived in China? Just as an example. How long do you think Islam has been in China? Yes. 14,000 years. 14,000 years. Anyone else? Excellent try. 1,000 years. Anyone else? How long do you think Islam has been in China for? 900 years. Excellent. All very close. Yes? Thank you very much. Islam has been in China. And why China? Because China is a less cosmopolitan, multicultural society than Australia. And Islam has managed to survive there for a thousand years. And if you go to China, one thing you find distinct, they are Muslim Chinese, but if you go to their masjids from outside, they don't even look like the masjid that you find in Pakistan or in Turkey. Rather, you find that their masjid from outside actually look like the other temples in China. But when you go inside, you find that they are masjid, masjid inside, because it was able to mold with the existing culture. When Muslims or Islam spread across the world, it came across Africa. So in Africa, Islam looked African. In China, it looked Chinese. What does that mean? It means, for example, if you go, if you go to Hajj, inshallah, if you, haven't been, if you haven't been for Hajj, you will go to Hajj, inshallah ta'ala. If you go for Hajj, nowadays you see two, two million or three million Muslims there. And if you look at the hijab of the sisters, you don't find one style where all of them are dressed in. You find they all are following the modest guidelines of Sharia. Following the modest guidelines of Sharia, but it's the, the nature of that modesty translated itself in different ways in different societies. So if you go, to, for example, to Africa, you find the sisters in Africa, they wear the hijab, and they're covering their modesty as prescribed by the Sharia, but it does not look like the way they do so in China. Because Islam did not prescribe a particular style or color in this case, but it's talked about modesty generally. And it allowed each culture to, to fashion its own way, to translate its own way in terms of modesty. The scholars, they tell us, therefore, Islam did not come to make us all Arabs. But it came to allow us to accept that which is good, useful, and bene beneficial and harmless from any culture. If you deny your Australianness, if you say, I'm not an Australian, Muslim, it means you deny a long historical presence of Islam in this country. Most of us know that Islam came to this country when? When do you think Muslims came to Australia first? Sorry? When it first started 50,000 years ago, my friend, the longest inhabitants of any continent are the Aborig Aborigines of this country. They've been here for at least 50,000 years. Yes. When do you think Muslims came to this country first? After the, after the British discovered it. After the British discovered it, after the British white settlement. Right? Um, before the British. When do you think? Sorry? When, when? It is 200 years before white settlement, at least. Most people know that mu the first Muslims to come to Australia were the cameleers, those who came and brought the camels in 1850. Actually, Muslims came to this country 200 years before that, in 1650 or 1750, before any white settlement came here. Muslims came from Indonesia, from Makassa, before anybody else, and they interacted with the aborigines of this country. They used to come and buy and sell with them. 
and they had an excellent relationship with them. In fact, now there is maybe other evidence that may tell us that Islam may have come here a thousand years ago, but that evidence has been investigated. The point is, if you deny being Australian, you deny a long-standing presence of Islam in this country. As it is okay to be a Pakistani Muslim, as it is okay to be an, an Arab Muslim, it is okay to be an Australian Muslim. As it is okay to be a Palestinian or an Arab or a Pakistani Muslim, it doesn't mean if you're a Pakistani Muslim you accept everything from Pakistan or you accept everything from Palestine. But you take that which is good from any culture, that which is good from any nation, and that should make up your identity. Today, scholars talk about positive identity. We as Muslims should have positive identities. What is a positive identity? Positive identity says that which is good is mine regardless of where it comes from. That which is good is mine. Based on the hadith, some say this hadith is da'if, it is weak, but the meaning is sahih, the meaning is authentic. And the hadith says this. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says, al-hikmah, wisdom, is the lost beast of a believer. Wisdom. Al-hikmah, dhalatul mu'min. It is the lost beast of a believer. Wherever he or she finds it, they grab it. Wisdom. De regardless of where you find it, you take it. What does this mean? I'll make it easier for you to understand. I was once in a lecture with some, some scholars, one scholar from Malaysia. He's a scholar in the Shafi'i School of Thought, and he's teaching at Oxford now. He says, to make it easy, it's like this. Imagine when a person, a married person, has given his wife a ring. Marriage ring. A marriage ring has value, sentimental value. And that ring is lost. She lost the marriage ring, right? One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, they can't find the ring. One day, a person, a stranger, total stranger, finds the ring outside, and he comes to give you the ring. He knows this is your ring to give it to you. But this stranger, he doesn't believe in what you believe. He doesn't look the way you look. He doesn't eat the way you eat. He's a total stranger. In fact, if you looked at him, you'd probably say, I don't want to associate with this person. So he has a total different way of life, if you like, but he brought you something that you value. Will you take the ring, or will you say, I don't want the ring because you are giving it to me? Will you take the ring? Of course you'll take the ring. Because it is the value is in the ring regardless of who's giving it. That is why one of the signs of arrogance, kibr, one of the signs of kibr is to reject truth. Batarul haqqi, rejecting truth. Somebody comes to you with something that is truthful and you reject it not because it's truthful, because you don't like the person. There are in every culture, my brothers, there is good and bad. Whether you are in an Arab culture or an Indian culture or a Pakistani culture or an Australian culture, there is the good and there is the bad. A Muslim always says that the bad is not mine, regardless of where it comes from. But the good I will take and become part of my identity. This is what the ulama understood from the verse where Allah Ta'ala says, خُذُ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Some ulama said that this ayah is a proof that it is okay to accept the, the values and the cultures of other people if they are good cultural values. I want to give you, share one simple example with you about an Australian identity. All of you know that Australian people generally are easygoing. She'll be all right, mate. You know, very easygoing. She'll be okay. She'll be all right. When I went to university, and some of you, when you have been to university or when you go to university, one thing you find about Australians is that they are easygoing. Correct? They have this basata. They have this, not simplicity, that you go into a classroom where the professor is teaching and he's not dressed the way you expect him to be if you're in Lebanon or in, you are in Jordan. You walk into the classroom and the doctor is teaching. He has to be presented in a certain way and you have to call him Dr. Sahib and you have to give him the titles. You walk into a lecture in, 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 in any Australian university, you call him Professor John, he says, mate, just call me John, right? Just call me John. There is, it's called informality. Informality meaning there is no formalities really in Australia. They are very often very, they like things to be easy. Just she'll be okay. She'll be all right, mate. Informality, believe it or not, this idea of informality is actually one of the sunnas of Rasulullah He was an informal person. He didn't like attributes. He didn't like titles. And he was, sallallahu alayhi wa so simple in his conduct that in fact his informality 
you cannot find in most Muslim countries nowadays. For example, when Nabi Sallallahu walked inside a room and the Sahaba were sitting, they stood up to greet him. He said, sit down. Do not honor me like the people of the past honored their kings. I am only a abd. I am only a servant. Anas ibn Malik says, when Nabi Sallallahu used to eat, he used to eat, كان يأكلك العبد. He used to eat like a slave. Sitting on the floor, eating with three fingers, without, without the, the frills and without the decorations. Informality. So if you look at this aspect of Australian life, informality, you can easily, as a Muslim, say, well, that is easily consistent with my identity as a Muslim. Nabi Sallallahu was informal. If you go to countries like, and no, not to mention any particular country, but if you go to some countries in Southeast Asia, Muslim countries, before you reach the name of the man Muhammad, for example, before you get to the name Muhammad, you have to go through a title of four or five labels. Dato Sri Hajji Dr. Professor Muhammad Abdullah. You have to have that formality. Now, really, if you go back to the life of Rasulullah and the companions, they did not like, like this formality. They were very informal. And that is why Ibn Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud said about the Sahaba, he's a man kana mustannan fal yastanna bil ladhina qad matu. If you want to follow the, the, the pathway of anyone, follow the pathway of those who died. Ulaika ashabu Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were the friends of Muhammad, the companions. Kanu atqa hadhi al-umma quluban. They had the most righteous of heart. Wa aqallaha takallufan. And they had the least to do with formalities. They were very informal. So this is an aspect that you can look at and say, well, this is consistent with my being Muslim and being Australian. It is okay to be Australian Muslim who belongs to a Bangladeshi heritage. There's nothing wrong with that. It is okay to be Australian Muslim who continues to admire and respect his Pakistani heritage. It is okay to be an Australian Muslim who understands, who reads and writes English and also his mother tongue language. That is all fine and that is how Muslims done it in the past. One of the greatest fuqaha, one of the greatest commentators of the Qur'an, one of the greatest mufassirun, for example, we all know, know his name. If I mention his name, you'll know. Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi. Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi was one of the greatest commentators of the Qur'an. His name, his actual name is Al-Qurtubi, meaning of Qurtuba or Cordova, a prominent city in Spain. It's like saying the, the, the Imam Al-Usturali, the Australian Imam. They had no problems with these type of identities, local identities, because they believed, I can be a Muslim and a Pakistani, I can be a Muslim and an Arab, I can be a Muslim and an Australian. There are two groups of people out there who don't want you to think that you're Australian Muslim. One, the extreme right of the Australian society, the conservative, those who are, they call them Islamophobes, those who are against Islam and Muslims, and regardless of how Australian you are, they say, no, you're, an, you're not an Australian. They want you excluded from this society. And to them we say, no, we are part and, par part and parcel of this cult country. And there are some Muslims on the extreme also who want you to deny your Australianness because they say, you are only a Muslim. And that is a problem because, yes, you are a Muslim first and foremost, but if you were living in Jordan, it's okay for you to say, I'm a Muslim Jordanian. Absolutely no problems. The love of one's own country, you mustn't think that loving one country goes against deen. In fact, loving one's own country is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu He loved Mecca, for example, sallallahu alayhi wa And being loyal to one's country is part of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu What we reject is anything that is bad. So, for example, in Australia, alcoholism, we say that is not me. I reject it. That is not part of my identity. Womanizing, that is not, not part of my identity. Uh, women violence, that is not part of my identity. We can say that. Or drug abuse, that is not part of my identity. I, I refuse to take any of these, whether it is in Australia, or in Pakistan, or Jordan, or Morocco, or Tunisia. Because bad is bad regardless of where you are, and good is good regardless of where you are. So in a nutshell, to, to, come, to, to, to uh, finalize this, one of the greatest achievements of Islam, in fact, and Islamic civilization, is that it was able to harmonize Islam and indigenous cultures. In fact, Islam succeeded in not destroying local cultures, like the, like the colonial, uh, colonizer, colonizers, when they went to different countries, they destroyed local cultures. When, when the British or the Italians or the French went to Muslim countries, the first thing they did is destroy local cultures. 
But when Islam and Muslims went to places like, like Spain, instead of destroying local cultures, they enhanced local cultures. And that is why when Muslims came first to Australia and interacted with the Aborigines, they did not fight with them, but rather they worked along with them. And when Islam went to Africa, it enhanced it. A thousand years ago, Timbuktu was one of the greatest seats of learning. Mali was a center of learning in Africa. Today, Africa is, is impoverished. But a thousand years ago, because of the presence of Islam, Africa was very wealthy. And Islam did not say to the Africans when they became Muslim, deny your African identity. And Islam did not say to the Chinese when they became Muslims, deny your Chinese identity. In fact, and this is somewhat academic, but I'll try to interpret it, uh, simplify it. Islam says, do not commit what they call cultural apostasy. Meaning, don't leave your culture and saying, no, I've got nothing to do with my culture. This is actually problematic and it can make you dysfunctional. To become functional Australian Muslim, you have to recognize that which is good and take it. And for example, anything that is good, for instance, quickly, the very idea of fair go in Australia, that's an Australian identity. Should that be consistent with my Muslimness or Islamness? Yes, fair go, I should have fair go. The idea of being compassionate towards animals. Just take that for example. You know there is more compassion towards animals in this country than all Muslim countries. I know it's hard to swallow, but that is a fact. It's unfortunate reality. Back home when I used to, we, when, when we were your, 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 your age, uh, when I was in one of those, uh, we'll be standing in the suburb, in the street. You see it also in different, and if a donkey passed by, or a dog, oh, maskeen. Any rock that is next to you, bang, bang, bang. Right? It, although, although it is our Rasul, وسلم, it is our deen that told us to be compassionate and gentle to animals. Correct? The camel came to complain to the Prophet وسلم, of being overloaded and not fed. And the Prophet said, who is the owner? And after three times the man said, I am. He says, fear Allah regarding this camel. You will be asked about it. Fear Allah. Feed it and don't load it too much. One of the, one of the, most, uh, one of the typical images that was sent around by the internet is that of a donkey in Pakistan or somewhere. A donkey that was carrying a cart behind it. Because the cart was so overloaded, the donkey was suspended in air like this. Right? The Prophet ﷺ passed by a tree, and there were Sahaba there, and there was a bird, a mother bird, hovering in distress. He said, what have you done to this bird? They said, we took its babies. He says, can you not see that this bird is stressed and distressed? Give it back. They said, oh, Prophet Allah, will we be rewarded for looking after animals? He said, you will be rewarded for looking after every living being. So if you look at this aspect only of kindness and gentleness towards animals in this country, that should become part of my identity. I don't have a problem with that because that is consistent with my Islam. And so the, it is a problem when you say, I am not an Australian, meaning you are rejecting everything about Australia, including that which is good and useful. And that is a problem, my brothers. So the most important thing is that how, especially the young people, those who are listening, how to become functional Australian Muslim or Muslim Australian, without compromising your Islam, but at the same time taking that which is good from this country and from this culture, insha'Allah ta'ala. May Allah Azza wa give me a new the tawfiq to do so. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.